the Fed will be cutting rates to 0%. Not two, not three, not three and a half, to 0% once the recession really hits. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. When today's guest was last on this program in early February, he warned that the markets were in la-la land, meaning they were too optimistic at a time when the macro data was warning of an approaching recession. Well, here we are a quarter later and after swooning for a month and a half, the S&P has powered back to exactly where it was when he gave his warning. It's in rally mode despite the macro data raising even more recessionary alarm bells today. That, plus we've experienced several systemic scares since February, including the collapse of sizable banks Credit Suisse and Silicon Valley Bank. Are the markets seeing true upside here that the bears are just missing? Or are the markets simply seeing what they hope to see and ignoring reality, setting themselves up for a painful reckoning? For a detailed exploration into these key questions, we welcome Alf Pecatiello, publisher of the Macro Compass and former bond portfolio manager, back to the program. Alf, it's great to see you again. Thanks so much for joining us late your time all the way from the Netherlands. Adam, always a pleasure to be here at Wealthian. Nice to see you again. Hey, great. Well, look, Alf, um, I love talking with you. The conversation uh, always goes in more directions than we have time for. I'm sure that's going to be true today. So I'll try to power through all these questions if, as efficiently as possible. But let's start with the one we always start with, which is what's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Look, financial markets are feeling what I would call the summer 2007 vibes. That's where they sit today. So let's take a step back. Shall we go to summer 2007? What had happened back then was that in 2006 and in early 2007, the Federal Reserve had raised interest rates from 25 to 5.25% in consecutive 25 basis point hikes. So the hiking cycle was pretty long. It lasted quite a while. And the reason why the Fed was doing that is the housing market in the US was red hot. We discovered later on why it was red hot, a bit artificially so, but it was red hot. Inflation was trending towards over 3% by early 2007. The labor market was still pretty resilient. And the Federal Reserve wanted to take some of the animal spirits out of the market. So what it ended up doing was exactly what it did in 2022. It raised interest rates to basically around 5%, and it did so pretty convincingly. Come summer 2007, though, Adam, and the Federal Reserve paused their hiking cycle. They basically didn't hike rates effectively throughout 2007. Up until September 2007, they kept interest rates at 5.25%. The US economy, though, was not in a recession yet. In 2007, it was growing not that much, was below trend growth. It was, you know, bad breath kind of growth as well. It was clearly slowing down. But the Federal Reserve wasn't cutting rates. Inflation was already trending down. It was very clear where things were going, but the Federal Reserve could only pause. I think listeners have probably already understood where I'm going because summer of 2023 might well look like in the eyes of the market, exactly like summer of 2007. Because look at this parallel, Adam. You have the Fed having hiked rates in 2022 to take animal spirits out of the market, slow down inflation, slow down the economy. They hiked all the way up to basically 5%. I think this is where we go in May. But inflation is trending down. Core inflation on an annualized basis is going down sub 4%, soon, I think, in summer towards 3.5%. Surely so when the rent of shelter comes down, also in official figures. Effectively, the Fed is looking at what looks like a soft landing and deciding to pause. They cannot cut rates yet, but they will pause. They will pause while the economy is clearly slowing down and inflation is trending down as well. And markets generally tend to cheer on a Fed pause. At the, at the very mm. first instance, they like that very much. And why? Because it removes the uncertainty. 
in 2022, Adam, you didn't know where Powell is going to stop. You had no idea. By September, he sounded like Volcker, basically. I mean, the guy was nonstop. He was repeating that he didn't know what the terminal rate was. He needed to go higher and tougher, which, of course, he didn't at some point. He slowed down the pace of hikes. But now, when the Fed pauses, you remove that tail risk. The uncertainty of the Fed having to hike to 6 or 7% is taken off. And so the volatility comes down in markets. Markets relax. And the stock market can take a breather and rally. And that's what we are seeing now. Does this last? Well, we can discuss it together. Okay. So I'm um, using your 2007, 2007 analogy. Um, while you were talking, I was just checking out a chart of the S&P. Uh, and it pretty much powered through the end of 2007. It really didn't start turning over until 2008. <laughs> um, I know from talking to you last time that you expect some sort of reckoning here at some point. If I remember correctly, last time when you were on the channel, uh, you were thinking the markets could correct by around 20% or so. We'll get to that in a bit, whether you still think that's the case. Do you, do you see the potential for markets to rally through the end of the year before they correct here this time around? Ooh, end of the year, I think, is a very stretched time horizon. But short term, this is something that also on the macro compass have been highlighting. I wouldn't be surprised to see the market relaxing and interpreting this pause as something to cheer on. But it is also very mechanical, Adam. And we can try to decompose for our audience, how does this happen? Why is the stock market rallying? So look, let's discuss the Fed pause. The entire market now understands that the Fed is going to hike in May and very likely stop there. Fed funds will be at 5% at that point, Adam, or inflation will be trending towards 3.5%, which means real Fed funds adjusted for inflation will be positive by 1.5%, mm -hmm. well above the equilibrium levels in the US, which are about zero, zero and a half. So that means the policy is tight. The Fed got there. Now at this point, Adam, with the liquidity crisis that we had in the banking system, which didn't turn into a systemic crisis, but it was quite a scare with the economy, which is weakening as well pretty rapidly. And with a tight Fed policy in place, what do you do as a Fed policymaker? Well, you just keep the policy tight, but you stop harassing markets by hiking further and further. You just keep policy tight for whatever you think it's necessary as a period of time. You pause, in other words. You don't cut rates, but you pause there. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but, but, but that's what Powell has been saying is his plan. You know, I've got to, got to, I don't know, not, not too many rate hikes left. And then I'm going to hold for the rest of the year is what he's been yes. saying. That's what he's been trying to say. Now, there are reasons why, because in the past, every time that Fed funds were positive over one, one and a half percent in real terms, adjusted for inflation, this was generally enough to slow the economy down and to slow inflation down. So Powell would basically say, I am there. I am tight. I see that inflation is trending down. I'm just going to keep tight until I achieve my objective. What does it do to the bond market? Volatility in the bond market comes down pretty aggressively. And why, Adam? Pretty simple. There is a pretty certain path ahead. The Fed isn't going to hike. The Fed isn't going to cut. The Fed is going to hold. And as it holds, the volatility comes down in the bond market. Right. Why Markets is that? Don't like uncertainty, pause with a commitment behind it gives you some certainty. Correct. So you don't spend a lot of premium by buying, um, you know, insurance against a big cutting cycle, a big hiking cycle. There is no reason why to buy this insurance premium at that point. Volatility compresses in the bond market. And as it does so, what happens is the biggest component of all institutional portfolios in the world, treasuries, stop delivering all this volatility to portfolios. They, re, they do actually their job. They provide investors with a steady stream of cash flows and they stop being so volatile as they were in 2022. When that happens, investors all of a sudden are like, well, now I can take some more risks elsewhere, can I? If the bond market isn't that volatile and we are not in a recession right now and the Fed is promising me not to hike further, well, Maybe I can take some risks here and there. 
And that's the first mechanism that happens. People are basically sucked in by the fact that volatility is very low, things look very calm, things look predictable and under control. And exactly like they did in summer 2007, they start piling up in risk assets. I just uh, delivered... It, it, sorry to interrupt, but just, just to underscore this point. So people people begin to take on more risk because they have the impression that things have become safer. But you're saying, just as we saw with 2007, this is actually one of the most dangerous moments because it precedes the big waterfall. <laughs> so well, it's look, this false sense of safety. Correct. So the thing is, this can last. In 2007, it lasted for six to seven months. So this can last quite a lot in principle. I think this time we're a bit more advanced in the macro cycle. It won't last six or seven months. But I'm just trying to explain what are the dynamics behind the rally we are seeing. It's a compression of volatility, Adam, that brings people in. It also brings in mechanical flows. With mechanical flows, I mean CTAs, mm -hmm. trend following, volatility targeting funds, all big words. But what they mean is basically these are funds that use volatility as an input for their investment decisions, Adam. So the lower the implied and realized volatility in the bond market, in the stock market, which happens because of this Fed pause, it's all very predictable, right? So volatility comes down. We are seeing the S&P 500 realized two-week volatility at the lowest level in years. Basically, the S&P isn't going anywhere. It's a slow grind up. And when that volatility becomes so compressed, all these funds that use volatility as, a, as an input to their models, they're said on their models, buy more. You can buy more. You can lever up because volatility is coming down. And so they're sucked in and they compound this slow grind up that we are seeing. It's a mix of mechanical flows, the bond market volatility compressing and convincing institutional investors they can take more risks because things are looking very calm. It's a self-fulfilling mechanism. What they did in 2007, I just did a study for the Macro Compass clients. If you look across asset returns, the, the assets that perform the best were actually the most risky out there. Emerging market, high beta, equity markets, the, the Chinese markets rallied 40% between March 07 and September 07, just before the great financial crisis. The Brazilian real, currency that are very dependent on global economic growth and are very sensitive to volatility rallied the most. Why? Because volatility was coming down. So people not only took risks, Adam, but they took risks in the highest beta, more risky, more volatile assets out there. 2008, we all know what happened, right? Right. Okay. So in 2008, what really set things off was the failure of Lehman, right? You, you, you had a breakage, right? Is that your expectation this time around too, which is that everybody thinks the halcyon days have returned, the capital flows back into the markets, the indices are grinding higher, everything looks great, but because rates are now at a much higher level, yeah. we find that we, we wake up one morning to find that somebody who is too overexposed to leverage and is system, systemically important breaks, and then the whole house of cards starts coming down? Look, Adam, first thing I'm going to say is don't trust the official's definition of where we are in the cycle. Uh, as a reference, in September 07, the Dallas Fed president said that we were perfectly on track for soft lending in a Reuters interview. Worse, in March 2008, as we were already deep into the great financial crisis effectively, or sowing the seeds for it, the Federal Reserve came out and in, in their official um, forecast said, maybe they might see a mild recession ahead. Well, soft landing and mild recession are also the words we are hearing right now. So I'm not going to say that this is 2008 again, necessarily so, but one thing, one warning notice for listeners is do not listen to Fed officials or to government officials on where we are in the macro cycle. Yeah. And if I can just add to that, I, I just released an email, uh, an email, a video about an hour before we're recording here, Alf, with um, Michael Kantrowitz. And he has a slide that I'll try to put up here, which shows the newspaper headlines that, that preceded, I think, almost every market correction um, since the early 70s when the term soft landing was first coined. And it's ridiculous. I mean, you see the word soft landing 
in every official's assurance that, oh, don't worry, everything's fine. We're going to have a soft landing. <laughs> so it's almost like a code word for the system's going to break pretty soon. But Adam, look, it always looks like a soft landing at first. It's always mathematical. I mean, look, unemployment rate is always at this lowest level just before a recession starts. It's the way economic cycles are built. Economic growth is very strong. Hiring gets very strong because companies are making profits. They're expanding. They hire. The pace of hiring matures, but still unemployment rate remains compressed. And forward-looking macro indicators start to suggest that we are in a downturn. But our data still looks very robust. Even today, non-farm payrolls are rising at over 200,000 a month on average, even a bit more as we speak. So even if the economy starts slowing down, when it slows down from very hot levels, it necessarily looks like a soft landing. I mean, the first steps down from the top of the mountain don't look like you're you know, rumbling all the way down and, and, right. and go, going into a snowballing effect. You can take the first ones and still it looks like everything is fine. It only accelerates the snowball effects and the downfall later on in the cycle. So it always looks like a soft landing at first, by definition, I would say. And look, what I think it's going to happen when it comes to markets and the progress of the macro cycle, which was your question before, is it is very hard to predict when a credit event really happens. We haven't seen any yet. We have seen a liquidity stress in some poorly run banks. That's what we have seen so far. I think that the shape of this recession will be, interestingly so, a labor market-driven one first. Hmm. People have a very hard time with that because the labor market looks very strong on the surface. The reality is that under the hood, the labor market has already been deteriorating for a while. The pace of full-time hirings in the US is very, very slow. Temporary workers have been fired already, which is normally a leading indicator for what happens to permanent workers. Mm -hmm. If you don't need a lot of workforce, you, you will first dispose of your less trained temporary workers and only later on move to your permanent staff, right? Where the labor costs are more crucial and also their skills are more crucial to their business, you're only going to cut them later on. So there are already warning signals between the pace of hiring, the fact that even at the pace of hiring basis, lately, most of the hiring has been happening in healthcare, government, education. Those are the sectors that are hiring on a net basis in a robust way. Those are not cyclical sectors, Adam. If you look under the hood, construction, transportation, trade, financial, all the cyclical areas of the labor market are already weakening in terms of hiring. And we have had the pace of full time hiring slowing down and temporary workers, which normally lead permanent worker strand being already on a declining basis. So it looks right. to me it's like- it started we've, already, we've also seen the announcements of hiring freezes that went on the past couple of quarters. We've seen more layoffs in 2023 than we saw in all of 2022. So there, to your point, there is a lot of data, if you look under the hood, that suggests the labor market is not nearly as robust as the jobs reports have suggested, especially the early jobs reports in early 2023, and I've talked with a number of experts on this channel about how some of them just look too rosy to be believed. And we're beginning to see some revisions recently that show that, yeah, maybe they weren't as robust as the government was saying. Correct. So the other thing is that official figures are vastly revised afterwards. So difficult to have a look at non-farm payroll and, and try to grasp what is the real status of the labor market on the ground. So you need to use a broader set of indicators when you look at those, the situation isn't that rosy. The trend is also very clear. We are going towards a weaker labor market. Markets, though, also care about the interconnection between the Federal Reserve reaction function and growth on the ground. And the hurdle for the Federal Reserve to cut interest rates this summer is very high. I don't think that Powell wants to be seen as the guy that loosens too early. Simply because he was wrong. He was too wrong in 2021, Adam. He was really wrong. He called this transitory. He said there was no need to hike interest rates. Right. And he was too wrong. Too. And as a policymaker, and I had the luxury to be able to speak to some of them because of my previous job, 
people think that the biggest weapon of a central bank is QE, QT, interest rates, hikes, cuts. The biggest asset of a central banker is credibility right. or forward is it guidance. Yeah. Yeah. It is words because they can steer market reaction, market sentiment with the reaction function alone. The only way, though, to preserve this ability is to be credible, is to say, if you're going to get to 2% inflation, we are going to get there. And I don't care how much does it cost, which means even if it becomes, as it becomes clear that the labor market is weakening and inflation is trending down, Powell will not be cutting rates immediately. He will be waiting. He will be on pause. Think about the markets, though. All of a sudden, they realize that the Fed on pause is nothing to be particularly happy about. They're on pause while the economy is walking towards a recession. So what do you do as a market participant where interest rates are still over 5% and earnings growth is collapsing and the labor market is really weakening and we're walking in a recession? Do you want to own stocks which are trading at 9 Buy a bunch of bonds. Yeah, exactly. Why in those rates? Right? Also, the valuations at some point will matter. So what I think here is going to happen is we're going to get one of these nice chances when volatility is really compressed. These puts are really cheap because at some point, Adam, I think in a couple of weeks, nobody will want protection anymore. Hey, there is no recession. The Fed is done with hiking rates, Adam. We're good. There is no default anywhere. Look, the banks are great. Look at the earnings, which are backward looking, by the way. So look at the earnings from last quarter. Look how they're doing great. No bank is going belly up. The Fed is on pause. That's what the market is going to be thinking. This is not true, but this is what the market narrative is going to be in a couple of weeks. Why would I need to spend premium to buy these puts? Why would I need to do that? I'll actually just go and buy some Brazilian equity market right now because I, I feel the Fed is on pause. The dollar is weakening. I'll need to buy some risk assets. Exactly at that point, in a couple of weeks, maybe three, maybe four weeks, there will be some really cheap optionality to own. Well, first of all, the easiest, as I always say, and as my mentor used to say, Alf, don't complicate things. Like, don't buy hedges. If you are, if you are invested in the, in the stock market and you see this massive rally and you want a hedge, why don't you just sell some of your stocks at that point, right? That would be a good edge. And you go back into cash, which is still paid 5%, or you buy some bonds because the Fed can only resist as long before it's forced to cut interest rates, and therefore the bond market benefits from it. And there will be this transition period where the market is enthusiastic, feels the summer 2007 vibes, Adam, and I think this is going to be a great opportunity, possibly the last one that investors have to steer that, their portfolio towards a recession at very cheap levels. That is uh, that is really valuable insight right there, uh, Alf. And I want, I want to dig into this a little bit more with you here. So first off, um, uh, totally get your point that uh, if, if if people think you know salad days are here again um, for all the reasons you mentioned earlier, uh, they're just not going to want to you know buy hedges, buy insurance. So put put costs should come way down. That's definitely the time to buy if you want to go short equities. Um, sounds like bonds should really participate uh, as as the market begins to wake up to the fact that oh gosh maybe we were wrong. Uh, let's start getting out of stocks and get into bonds. As you said, that might be the last great opportunity here for bonds. Um, uh, real quick, um, let's say even before uh, the, the the equity market starts weakening or or, or, or you know rolling over to a certain extent. Um, Let's just say we get to the point where July arrives, right? So right now, I believe the the markets, the the Fed funds futures is predicting the first rate cut in July, and then they're predicting cuts basically to the rest of 2023. You've just explained a lot of reasons why Powell is not going to do that unless he absolutely has to gun to the head, uh, and if he does gun to the head, it's probably for reasons that are not going to be bullish for the markets either. <laughs> Um, so let's say Ju July comes around. Is the market going to have to reprice if indeed Powell is basically just sitting there solidly saying, I'm I'm flat and I'm not changing? 
Yeah, you see that the bond market is already having to reprice a bit higher yields because all these cuts which were priced as emergency, basically on the banking crisis, well, need to be unwound, Adam, because there is no emergency anymore, right? Yeah. So at some point, the market was even pricing no hikes anymore in April, no hike in May, and then cuts immediately thereafter. Now, because those cuts aren't going to happen and the market knows that, it needs to incorporate them in a new pricing. So we have seen bond yields moving a bit north. Your question is, will they have to move a bit north further when Powell stubbornly refuses to validate those cuts in summer? And the answer is, yeah, it might well be. Over the next few weeks, the market might ask themselves, why am I in a trade betting Powell will cut in July if this guy is going to just stubbornly pause. And as they unwind these trades, bond yields have to move a little bit higher. Now, the thing is, people always want a level. They want to buy 10-year treasuries at 4%, at 4.25, at 4.5. The reality is, the best returns achieved in the bond market on a 12-month basis and I mean 10% plus returns, the returns that can shield you against the proper equity downturn are achieved in two conditions, Adam. The first is when nobody wants bonds. The second condition is when we were close enough, but not yet to a recession. Generally, if you are able to buy bonds three to four months before the recession, that's the best period to be able to do so. So let's, let's reflect together. When nobody wanted bonds, the apex of that narrative was just before the banking crisis. It was mm -hmm. the higher for longer narrative, Adam. You remember that? Oh, we, yeah. we were here at Wealthion and we discussed like, hey, we have this tre two-year treasuries at 5%. Nobody wants bonds anymore. Nobody needs them. They think that they don't, they don't need them. And this is generally a good uh, moment where to start buying bonds. but. Even then, we were not so close to a recession, were we? I mean, this was like February. We are late April. We are not yet in an unambiguous recession, at least. So again, there is no perfect timing exam. It's impossible to say when. And maybe the moment where bonds were hated the most is already past us. But still, if you get a chance to buy bonds two to three months before a recession starts, and my base case is, Somehow, mid-summer, we're going to be seeing non-farm payrolls trending so below 100,000 a month, which is basically enough to start pushing unemployment rate up, which is the clear signal of a recession. If you're able to buy those, you shouldn't be too greedy on the levels. One of my lessons I learned managing money is that tops and bottoms are for fools and liars. So it's mm -hmm. more about asset allocation and how do you want to position your portfolio? My point is, as people become very relaxed over the next few weeks, bond yields might provide a great opportunity to start loading up a bit more as we get closer to a recession and maybe selling some stocks when the S&P will be trading above 4,200. All right. That is very, like I said, valuable, actionable uh, context here or, or, or actionable uh, advice here. Um, would you, let, let's say somebody doesn't have a lot of exposure to bonds right now. Would you recommend that they sort of start dollar cost averaging in starting now? Or would you wait for this key signal of, you know, new hires beginning to come in sub 100K? So look, we are looking at 10-year treasuries at, well, let's do 30-year treasuries at 380, right? 380%. Wow. I own already some in my ETF portfolios on the Macro Compass. Decent exposure. I'm not fully loaded. But the way I will be approaching this, Adam, is basically dollar cost averaging. If you have a medium to long-term view on your ETF portfolio, and it's an asset allocation, it's not, it's not a trading portfolio, then what you want to do is accumulate a position in bonds that you can benefit from in a recession, but you can't put all your eggs in one basket and say, unless it goes to 4%, I'm not going to buy them. Because the difference between having zero bonds in your portfolio in a recession or having some, even at a slightly worse level, is massive. 
mm-hmm. because everything else you have in the portfolio will be drawing down, maybe except for the dollar and, with, and maybe except for gold. But if you look at the dollar and gold in all recessions, it's not clear cut what the performance is, right? In some recessions, there are deleveraging events. There is credit stress and gold doesn't do well then because people have to liquidate all assets they have to try and right. repair their balance sheet, including gold. In that case, the dollar performs well because it's a scramble for collateral. So you, you go there and you just want dollars. In other recessions, dollar does pretty bad because it's a recession that is maybe driven by the labor market and by earnings. So the Fed cuts rate really aggressively. And so the dollar depreciates and gold does very well. But there is one asset that does well in all recessions and it's bonds. Because as the Fed cuts rates aggressively, the bond market benefits from it. Now, the question is, do you want to cherry pick exactly the perfect level to buy a bond allocation that protects you in a recession? Or do you want to start accumulating as you ask? Then I think the answer is you probably want to start accumulating. All right. And how would you... Encourage the average investor to think about duration as they begin to build their bond exposure. Now, you mentioned the 30 year, you know, you're going to get the biggest appreciation if the recession hits and everything you think is going to happen at the long end of the duration curve. But of course, in the bond market, that's where the majority of the risk is. Yes, you're right. And look, this is really a question of leverage and uh, sophistication of investors. Because Adam, you're totally right that most of the performance from a basis point perspective will happen at the front end. Why? If the Federal Reserve cuts by three, 400 basis point, most of the appreciation, most of this gets results into the front end of the bond market because two-year interest rates basically reflect Fed funds over the next two years. So if the Fed all of a sudden cuts to zero and you buy bonds when you know, they're still pricing Fed funds on average at 4% over the next two years. You clearly have quite an edge there, right? But obviously, the duration in these bonds is very short. So there are some ETFs that re- replicate one to two year treasuries, right? So what's going to happen there is because of the duration risk being very, very low, your percentage returns in your portfolio will also be lower. So in other words, you will be benefiting for a couple of years from the 4 or 5% levels that you locked in there, but you won't be benefiting from a lot of price appreciation because the interest rate sensitivity of these bonds is very, very small. So the change in interest rate won't benefit you a lot in terms of price appreciation. Now, if you move back to the curve and let's say 30 years, do 30-year bonds benefit from a cutting cycle from the Fed? Yes but less so than third than two-year bonds, right? Because a third-year bond, you have to imagine it as a strip of all the future Fed funds over the next 30 years, not over the next two years, right? So the Fed cuts, the first part of this strip comes down, but what about the remaining 28 years? It will still be related to growth and inflation. So basically, it will come down in yield terms, but less so than the front end, which is also known as bull steepening of the curve. The front end yield come down really rapidly and the back end comes down in terms of yields, but less rapidly so. So the curve steepens, driven by a bull market in bonds. Bond yields come down, bond prices go up. But in price appreciation terms, the duration in in an ETF like TLT or EDV for instance, these long-dated treasury ETFs, is 20 years. So the interest rate sensitivity of this uh, instrument is much, much, much higher, Adam. In other words, a 100 basis point move in a two-year bond in terms of price appreciation is basically the same as a 10 basis point move in these ETFs because the duration, the interest rate sensitivity is so much larger. So even if this part of the curve, the long end, doesn't move that much as the front end because of the interest rate sensitivity in price appreciation terms for a non-sophisticated investor that doesn't use futures, doesn't use leverage, doesn't use options, it is more rewarding as a protection to your portfolio still to own long-dated treasuries than front-dated bonds. Did I make any sense to you? 
Yeah, I think you did. I, I, uh, you, you very much did in terms of explaining how they work. Um, I guess I'll say my shorthand and then you can chime in on it, which is, look, if you're new to this, a uh, couple of things. Um, one, there's a, a free webinar that uh, I did with um, Michael Leibowitz over at RIA, who just goes through the, the, the mechanics of bond math. So if you don't feel like you understand bonds enough well enough right now, I'll put a link to that here. Feel free to go watch this after this video. But in general, you know, you you what's very common in bond investing is you put together a ladder of bonds of different durations, and and that composition really should be customized for your particular personal financial situation, your goals, your risk tolerance, your needs, all that type of stuff. Shorthand is I would say just work with a financial advisor that really understands bonds who can you know give you personalized advice on this. Make sure you find a financial advisor that's well experienced in bonds. Also, we'll talk about this a bit later in this video, um, but also you should subscribe to um, Alf's Substack uh, because I'm sure he will be giving you know increased insights to his viewers about how to think about owning bonds. Is that true, Alf? Yes, I actually started a free macro education series on my Substack, which is called the Macro Compass dot Substack dot com, and you know once a week, Adam, the idea is to give away some free. Um, educational insights on the on macro overall, portfolio construction, the bond market, de-dollarization, any of these big picture macro trends and events we hear, including how the bond market works. Yes, I will be doing that. Okay, great. Because I know it's, it's really funny. Um, bonds are a little more complicated to understand than equities. Um, I mean, they really... They don't have to be, but we as a populist just say, oh, gosh, when I have to start doing a little bit of math in my head, you know, it, it's scary and complicated. <laughs> but if you actually invest the time, uh, they're eminently understandable. Um, and, and, you know, the problem is, is we just don't get taught how to understand uh, bonds uh, in our education system. Right. And so a lot of people just feel, you know, they, they, they feel a bit of anxiety or, you know, uh, I, I just, you know, too complicated for me. It's really not, folks. You just have to invest the time to understand them. Um, all right, Alf. Well, look, um, <clears throat> so many ways I want to go with this discussion. Not a lot of time left. Um, I, I want to talk about something that you, uh, a few things that you've mentioned uh, recently in your writings. One is you've talked about <clears throat> the importance of liquidity going on in today's market and that um, it is it is shrinking, right? Like we have M2, which is actually contracting for the first time in like forever. Um there are a couple of other factors as well, but you have raised a warning flag to say, hey, it's likely going to get worse going yep. forward. And you mentioned uh, four things. You mentioned once the, the debt ceiling uh, is, is raised, then the Treasury has to start filling up the, the Treasury General account, the TGA again. Correct. That is going to be, uh, well, it'll be, it'll be stopping pumping money into the economy, which is what it's yeah. been doing. Um, and it will be releasing a ton of bonds, which will be soaking up capital to come into the bond market. True. Um, there's ongoing QT, both in the US and in Europe. Um, you said European banks are repaying their ECB loans. Um, this is one of the lending facilities that they have to, you know, basically restock. Um China and Japan's monetary stimulus programs are beginning to cool off. So you mentioned those four. I'm going to I'm going to add a fifth, which is post Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse, banks are tightening their lending standards even more than they were before, which also sort of substitutes as additional rate hikes. So we have all those factors in the in the mix or coming in the mix. How big of a deal is this going to be? It's big. And Adam, look, you mentioned the credit side of things, so the flow of money to the real economy, basically. And that, that was already coming down pretty aggressively, even before the banking crisis. Right. As you said, lending standards were tight even before that. They're now going to probably even worsen going forward. So we as the real economy, corporates, households, we're being choked from getting access from cheap credit now for a few quarters already in a row. And as credit creation leads economic growth, and we will not be creating more credit to the real economy going forward, you can also expect that growth comes down. When it comes to financial money creation, the money that central banks create, the money that goes into the financial system, the money that lubricates our financial system, these four um, explanatory variables that you put up there, I think they're really important because people have 
have, I think, overlooked the fact that over the last three months, we had the opposite. We had the Treasury drawing down their TGA, which pumps money into the system, into the financial system, right? It lubricates, basically, the financial system. Banks have more reserves to spend and transact against each other. In Japan, they basically did QE. They had to buy a ton of bonds there, the Bank of Japan, to make sure that their yield levels were kept. The yield curve control had to right. be there and functioning. China reopened the economy. It lent money to its banks. It stimulated basically liquidity in the financial system to restore growth and confidence. We had all these very weird mechanics that actually increased global liquidity. On the macro compass, I have an index called Global Macro uh, Compass Liquidity Indicator. And that indicator basically tracks the liquidity amongst the five largest economies. And it actually was increasing in the first quarter. Now, what's going to happen over the next few quarters? It's going to decrease for all the reasons you just mentioned. And on top of it, credit growth is likely to shrink further. So real economy money comes down, financial money comes down generally doesn't bode well for risk assets. Okay, so um, let's get to the money question here, which is, all right, so let's assume that the arc that you've been laying out in this interview actually does come to pass, right? Where um, we, we, we make it through the 2007 summer and we end up in the uh, you know early midwinter, uh, early spring of 2008, where the wheels come off everything. Yeah. Um, the last time you were in the program, as I said, you were sort of thinking, okay, you can see the S and P, you know, falling about twenty percent or so. Um, is that still more or less sort of what you're thinking here, or does this become something more dire? The way that two thousand eight was a pretty dire market crash. Yeah, look, it's very, it's harder to predict where the S and P five hundred will bottom. Uh, and I, I said before, bottom and tops are for fools and liars. But if you want a tagline for the interview, Adam, then here it is. The Fed will be cutting rates to 0%. Not two, not three, not three and a half, to 0% once the recession really hits. And this is a very controversial take. The reason why that is, is that people confuse trends with cycles. And so they've been telling me, Alf, look, the Chinese population is going to shrink over the next 10 to 20 years. We won't have that supply of cheap labor that we had over the last 20 years. We have deglobalization going on. We have a lot of reasons why inflation might be a bit more structural than it was in the past, right? So that means that interest rates have to be higher. And I'm like, yeah, it might be, but these trends will play out in 5, 10, 20 years from today. This is a macro trend that might be true or not. We will see over the next decade, Adam. Let's talk about the next few years. If you get a proper deleveraging type, disinflationary recession, like 2001, like 2008, I can ensure you that there will be no reason left for the Federal Reserve to hold rates, not at five, not at four, not at three, and not at 2%. The Fed will be forced to cut rates to 0%. Every recessionary episode of the last 100 years has lowered the inflation by seven percentage points. That would mean that if we start a recession round about now or in a month or two, you're actually at risk of seeing some deflationary periods momentarily. As people lose purchasing, purchasing power, they lose their jobs. There is a deleveraging effect, maybe. There is a crisis in the housing market. All these things can happen during a recession. Inflation comes down rapidly. The job market is collapsing. The Federal Reserve at that point cuts rates not to 3%, cuts rates to 0%. And that's a macro cycle, not the macro trend. And people confuse the two. Wow. All right. Um, very bold statement. Um, underscores the criticism of the Fed as being an overly extreme driver of the economy, right? It went way to one side in terms of stimulus in response to the pandemic. As you said, they kept raising all through 2021, even though it was clear that inflation was becoming a problem. Um, then they have raised rates. They've gone all the way into the direction. They've raised rates faster than at almost any time in history. And then you're saying they're going to go right back to ZERP. 
again um, when this thing really starts to hit. Uh, so it's sort of like the whiplash economy here. We're just winging from side to side here. Um, obviously, now I really know why you're so sanguine on bonds, um, because if the Fed is going to go to zero, then obviously bonds should do amazing, uh, especially at the long end of the curve. Look, and this is why I don't want to be too picky on the levels to accumulate bonds, because maybe you want to have 10 years at 4%. But what difference does it make not to buy them at 375 or at 360 or at 370 when you think that in a deleveraging episode and in a recession, the Fed will be forced to cut to zero? And the other reason why the Fed is so extreme, Adam, is the level of leverage in our system. Our system is based on credit. We keep being more indebted. Even China has raised their total economy debt to GDP from 100% to 300% in only 15 years. Even China was forced to go the same path. The more debt we add to the system, Adam, the more fragile it becomes, which means that at every deleveraging episode, at every recession, you're basically forced to whiplash all the way down to zero. Got it. And, and just for comparisons, we've been comparing 2007 with now. Back in 2007, just the federal debt alone, I believe, was around nine billion. Uh, sorry, nine trillion. Really, uh, yeah. And now it's what thirty-one plus trillion. It's look. The system is based on that. We have to offset an aging population and stagnant productivity, Adam. Somehow, how are we going to grow our economies? What we think is socially acceptable: a GDP growth of three percent a year. How are we going to achieve that? with an aging population, with shrinking labor force in most jurisdictions. How are we going to get that? Well, we get that through leverage. We become more indebted. We, we lever up the system. We create credit, in other words, to make sure that our purchasing power is artificially boosted by credit today. This is the reason also why house prices have gone up by 10% a year for the last 10 years. If you give access to credit in a cheap way every time to the new buyer. Somebody that can afford a house at $500,000 at 5% mortgage rate feels like he's done a good deal. What if the mortgage rate is 1%? All of a sudden, even if your salary isn't higher, you can lever up and you can buy a house which is worth a million dollars all of a sudden. This is the power of cheap leverage. And this is what we've been doing to our economy. That that though, is often unproductive. It today takes much more dollar of debts to create the same amount of GDP growth. And that also makes the system much more fragile. And that's why I think the Fed will be forced to cut to 0%. Right. And, and, and what's so sad about this is, is we can see where this road ends, right? All we got to do is just look at Japan, right? Um, and yet we are continuing to condemn ourselves to follow a similar path. Uh, Alpha, I hate to, to, to start speaking quickly to try to bring this to a close because I know that you uh, are, are back-ended here. Real quickly, um, so how, beyond just bonds, I'm assuming you're not allocating your portfolio 100% bonds right now, but if you are, let us know. How are you allocating for this right now? Because I know you have your public portfolios. Yeah, so what I'm doing now is um, I still have a pretty hefty chunk in T-bills in the US. I'm getting paid 5% to wait, just love it. Uh, so I'm keeping some of the of the money there, a pretty good chunk. I'm accumulating bonds, so I put the money where my mouth is, and I've started accumulating a reasonable position now in bonds. We'll be buying more. So as bond yields move up, because Powell is stubborn and doesn't cut, I will be buying more. I like equity markets, especially in the defensive sectors, if you have to allocate. So all the sectors that tend to do well in a recession or reasonably well in a recession are sectors that are not driven by cyclical growth and that pays stable dividends. So okay. consumer and staples- to be super clear, th those are equities you plan to hold going into the recession. Yeah, yeah, I do. So those are consumer staples, utilities, healthcare, this kind of services of, of sectors generally do well because they're stable, they're acyclical, they pay good dividends. And when the Fed is cutting rates, people want some sort of exposure to equity markets too. They start from the most defensive sectors. Also, I am considering allocating into gold because I think, you know, maybe in summer people don't want gold anymore because it doesn't pay any coupons. Why would you own gold? Things are fine. I think you should own some 
if you go in a recession, because you never know the type of damage that recession can do, Adam. So always good, I think, to own some gold. And I also like the Japanese yen. I mean, these guys in Japan are, are going to be doing very counter cyclical things here, like probably trying to get away of the yield curve control. So raising a bit interest rates in Japan, exactly at the moment when everybody else is trying to slow down and the world is slowing down too. So probably Japanese investors will repatriate some capital back to Japan. They are large investors in foreign assets, foreign equities, foreign bonds. But if you get good yields at home and the global economy is slowing down, you actually might repatriate capitals back to Japan, which strengthens the yen, which is also a defensive recessionary play. These are the type of allocations I'm looking at. Nothing YOLO. I'm not buying the Nasdaq at 30x uh, price mm -hmm. earnings. Uh, I'm sorry, but Maybe the next one or two months will be a bit uh, tricky with this asset allocation, but generally with these portfolios, I try to do some stable long-term asset allocation. And this is what the models are saying, looking six to 12 months ahead. I really appreciate you sharing this kind of detail with us. Two quick questions. Um, for the bonds that you're buying increasingly now or increase your exposure to, are you just sticking with sovereigns or are you buying any high quality, you know, the credit the spreads, Microsoft's? Look, credit spreads inevitably widen in a recession, Adam. There is nothing that prevents them from doing that. So by taking investment-grade corporates, even good quality, you are taking exposure to credit spreads. And those credit spreads widen. So they water down a bit your performance, right? And I think because they're already very tight, if you look where they're trading these credit spreads, they're pricing in no signs of recession. They're giving me no premium, basically, to buy them. I'm rather sticking with treasuries. Great. And then on the yen, how are you playing that? Is there like an ETF to be able to yeah. do that? There's an ETF, which is called, um, wait, let me check it on my portfolio as we speak. Uh, it's called FXY. It's a long Japanese yen ETF that basically allows you to take exposure via an ETF. This is not investment advice. Do your own homework and uh, check whether you really like the Japanese yen and talk to your advisor. Yeah, yeah, I would say. If you haven't traded these things before, talk to your advisor. Um, all right, well, look, Alf, I know you got to go. Thank you for giving us so much time and detail here. For folks that have really enjoyed this, would like to follow you and your work, where should they go? Themacrocompass.com. The Macro Compass is my investment research and portfolio strategy firm, which is trusted by thousands of investors worldwide, including some of the most renowned hedge funds out there. Nevertheless, don't worry. I do everything in plain English so that everybody can understand, perhaps with a bit of Italian accent. If you're interested in seeing my stuff, it's on the macrocompass.com. All right. Well, look, Alf, this has been wonderful. And wrapping up here, folks, just to underscore a message that both Alf and I have been delivering through this conversation is uh, there is some great opportunity here to position to potentially uh, not only protect your assets from what's coming, but but maybe actually grow them pretty substantially in response in the way that Alpha is lined out here. Um, but of course, you know there's a lot of risk involved in what's coming ahead too, if if Alpha's predictions are correct. So that's why we highly recommend uh, that you work. Uh, most people here that have real real jobs, real lives, real other things to focus on besides the markets should be working in concert with a professional financial advisor who takes into account all of the macro issues that, that Alf and I talked about here, um, but then you know, uses those to create a personalized uh, portfolio strategy for you, um, but not only creates the plan, but then actually executes it for you, you know, including you along the way, but is the one who's actually you know, proactively watching what the markets are doing, reacting to developments on the fly, making sure that your wealth is being um, well stewarded through the, the type of future that, that Alf sees ahead here. If you have a good one who is doing that for you well, great, you need to stick with them. But if not, or if you'd like a second opinion from one who does, feel free to schedule a free consultation with a financial advisors or endorsed by Wealthion. Uh, to do that, just go to Wealthion. Dot com. Again, you set up a, a free consultation. It doesn't cost you anything. There's no commitment to work with these guys. They just offer it as a public service to help as many people like you position as prudently as possible in advance of what may be ahead. Um, all right. And with that, uh, Alf, I uh, can't thank you enough for your time here, um, buddy. I hope I get to see you at some point this year. And if I do, uh, we will make uh, one of your famous Neapolitan pizzas, uh, this time with my wife's sourdough as the crust. Adam, that looked Awesome. And I have to say my standards are pretty high. I'm uh, Southern Italian. I'm Neapolitan. That looked awesome. 
And last thing I'm going to say is keep killing it on wealth. And I think some of the guys in the traditional media industry are feeling a bit of the pressure as we speak. You're really doing great. Keep on. No, you're very kind. It is entirely due to the quality of the guests that are willing to come on this program. So thank you so much for being one of them, Alf. All right. We'll end the mutual admiration society here. But Alf, thanks so much. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.